very quick announcements. So uh, this meeting is being uh, recorded for later showing by Amherst Media, but is not being live broadcast due to some technical issues. Uh, we also have Mr. Dumling uh, is, will not be attending tonight's meeting. Uh, he had another commitment. And uh, Ms. Spitzer will actually be about 10 or 15 minutes late to this meeting, but she will be coming um, a little bit later. Still, there is a, pres there is a quorum, so we can proceed with our meeting. Um, first order of business is to approve the minutes of March 19th, March 26th, which is Amherst only, and then March 26th, which was a joint meeting with Palm and the region. So I will give the members a few minutes to review each of these, and then we'll take motions for each of these uh, together, if you would like, or we can do them separately, but um, as efficient as we can be. information. These have been uh, sent to the committee prior to this meeting, but um, I always like to give people a chance to, to look them over. Mr. Nakajima. I move the approval of the Amherst School Committee, mini committee meeting minutes for March 19th, March 26th for Amherst only, and for March 26th, 2019 joint meeting with Palom in the Region. Okay, we have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any comments or edits on these minutes? Okay, all those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Westmoreland, once again, for putting these together. Um, next item on the agenda is uh, committee announcements. Are there any announcements from the committee? Seeing none. Um, I will move to public comment. So if anyone is here and wishes to make public comment, you are welcome to do so. We don't have microphones tonight, um, but you are welcome to come to the front here, state your name, and you have three minutes to speak. Okay, seeing no one coming up for public comment, I am going to close public comment. We don't have a gavel, so I'm just doing the, the uh, makeshift version of that. Um, I don't expect anyone to be rushing in here. It is a little bit before our normal time for public comment, but uh, if anyone comes in afterwards and is dying to make a public comment, we will certainly allow that to happen. Uh, next item on the agenda is a uh, superintendent's update. Dr. Morris? Sure. I wonder if the seven degree sunny weather has something to do with the uh, <laughs> Maybe just a little bit, yeah. It does feel like spring today, doesn't it? It really yeah. does. Um, so uh, a couple quick ones, and then and then uh, I had some of them written up, and some I'll just do early. But um, in terms of what's written, um, Last week on Thursday, I attended a meeting hosted by the Collaborative Educational Services and the chairs of the Joint Committee on Education, which is Senator Jason Lewis and Representative Alan, Alice Peich were there. Um, that was a really good opportunity for superintendents of Western Massachusetts, Massachusetts to share uh, the current funding challenges that we feel face, and, and they're different in different communities. For instance, Granby faces different challenges, or Hampton, which faces are more analogous, but slightly different challenges than us here in Amherst. Um, but it was uh, related to one of the topics later on the agenda about regionalization. There was um, really good dialogue, I thought, on that particular topic, um, especially uh, given that it sometimes gets presented as what should happen in Western Massachusetts. And, and multiple superintendents, myself included, talked about some of the challenges of regionalization efforts uh, from local communities. I know there was a second event that was for some school community members from our, our area uh, attended, as well as community members and uh, community members. So, um, but I enjoyed being there. Um, right before the break, there was Autism Awareness Night, so, night, so I want to thank CPAC for their role in organizing that event. And what felt uh, particularly um, distinct this year, uh, and I want to thank Dr. Brady, who's in the audience, for her work as well, uh, was, you know, I think very appropriate. There's an Amherst School Committee meeting. There were a number of elementary students who were uh, at the forefront of actually formally presenting uh, who they are, what their experience is like. Uh, and the things that help them learn uh, in school. And then I think in the past, my experience has been it's a little more secondary focused. And, and I think for logical reasons that's the case, but it was really impressive to see some students, uh, particularly students from Fort River Elementary, um, be able to talk about what their life is like being in a specialized program and what works for them and, and what they've learned about themselves um, throughout the years. And these are relatively young, not fifth or sixth grade children, mm -hmm. pretty young children. So it's neat. So thank you, Dr. Brady, and thank you, CPAC. Um, after 
all the work that um, the committee and the community did on the statement of interest, I just want to be really clear, we like triple check that they got everything that we <laughs> sent them, and they <laughs> did. Uh, so now we're in the uh, holding zone until December 11th when they share the results um, of which statements of interest they will accept and which they won't. But um, they got all of our documents and all of our documentation. So, um, and just yeah. to, if yeah, I can, please. Dr. Morris, uh, one quick com uh, comment for the committee. Um, so Representative Mindy Dom, has uh, agreed to uh, appeal to the MSBA in her official capacity as our representative, um, being made aware of you know her staff actually were at some of the listening sessions, Senator Joe Comerford as well, and um, we I have agreed to put together just some you know some brief uh, sort of factual talking points for them on the conversations that we had both with the community and here in this committee, and they will and I'll be sharing that with them this Friday coming up so that they can in turn take it to the MSBA. Um, and we actually just think that that's a really positive thing for our representatives to be doing mm -hmm. at a statewide level. So just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Uh, last night, Parker Farm third graders uh, successfully presented an initiative called the Read Around Town Project. Um, they presented it to the Amherst Town Council at their formal meeting last night. It was on the agenda. There was a unanimous vote by the council members to support this. And really, it, it installs, you may have seen these, uh, kind of like free libraries, their book mm -hmm. boxes, mm -hmm. um, particularly at bus stops in town, so that as people are traveling, particularly those who rely on public transportation, um, that there's opportunities for an exchange of books and for reading to be part of uh, the whole town's life. And this was an idea that um, staff worked on, or students worked on with staff, and just really neat. And um, I think it was uh, the, the word I got from the town manager and, and a couple of town councilors was the highlight of their evening last night to have those students uh, present their work um, and to be approved at the town council. That's great. Yeah, for example, really neat student advocacy. Um, <coughs> we had elementary science night also it was the week before break. Um, this was completely parent organized, um, parent um, initiated. We just provided some technical support and some thoughts about, you know, we provided buses to different um, housing complexes so that there was greater access. But uh, I wasn't able to attend from what I understand from those who were. It was great. We had a lot of just scientists in the community uh, who offered their uh, kind of individual talents and knowledge to our young, relatively young students. Um, and then 150 families come, which was the perfect number, because we were, it's always hard to know how big a space you need and how many tables you need until you get there. So that was actually pretty much exactly the target, which never happens. Um, but they were they were outdated and they want to do it again and even perhaps expand for next year. So again, just very appreciative of the resources within our parent guardian community, uh, our larger community. One thing that's not on here, um, and it's not just a regional item, although perhaps it comes up a little more often at the region is that, uh, or talked about at the region, is that um, we were awarded a grant from the state, a uh, divorce diverse teacher workforce grant um, that we applied for a couple months ago, and it'll provide support for our current paraeducators who we are working with to get licensure with MTEL courses and some course credits. Uh, we're still working on the details because not, you know, what you apply for and what you get in terms of funding isn't always exactly the same, so we're still working on that. Mr. Mangano was actually and his staff are working on some fine details with that this afternoon, uh, but we're thrilled to get it and we're thrilled to have Desi's uh, ongoing support in this initiative because they um, have really reorganized themselves to try to support districts uh, and make it a statewide initiative instead of just a purely local initiative, so we're appreciative of that. Um, the last item I wanted to, um, on the back you can see that Black Scholars Rising is coming up on May 3rd. All of you are welcome to attend that event. But um, the bulleted point on the agenda, so at the regional school committee meeting, the Amherstown Regional School Committee meeting, um, I presented two weeks ago, uh, yes, um, that I'd like to explore uh, an analysis of the sixth grade, um, where the sixth grade students are educated. So currently in the Amherst Public Schools, our sixth graders are educated out of three schools. And um, for a number of reasons, which I articulated at that meeting, I'd like to, um, and I have started to form a, a standing, excuse me, a steering committee or steering board uh, to work with a consultant to look at what would it look like in terms of the curriculum, what would it look like in terms of social emotional development, what would it look like in terms of leadership, and what would it look like in terms of staffing as some of those critical areas. Um, so to be really clear, and I think it, the like, italics are underlined, something I usually don't do in emails that this is not um, because we've made a decision or we think it's a good idea. It's actually, we did that facilities use study uh, at the region. We understand uh, the space um, needs and limitations and we want to take the next step of saying what would that programming look like? Yes, the space needs we have a good handle on, but what would this do for the education of sixth grade students? And what we'd like to do is go back um, to the committees uh, next winter with 
this is what it looks like for multiple committees to weigh in and their thoughts about. Um, but I wanted to highlight because that wasn't a joint meeting we had the last uh, when this was talked about the last, the most recent time. Um, just to make sure that at the Amherst School Committee meeting it was um, known. And if anyone's interested, I think we're taking nominations until May seventh or eighth. I believe so. Yeah, something like that. We've gotten good response to date yeah. from both staff members and community members. Uh, we're also looking for some students, more at the middle school um, level. If we can work out the logistics of elementary school students, we will do that. Um, but we have a, a nice sized group already um, mm -hmm. who are looking to dig into this work, which was starting, it will start in mid May. Dr. Morris, is, um, has there been anything posted online or shared that how committee member, community members can actually apply to participate in this if they would like to? Sure, so yeah. That we could share out as a committee? Absolutely. So um, <coughs> I can ask Ms. Westmoreland to um, perhaps resend the email that went out to the community to the committee so that if it's forwarding to people who may not have gotten that, then we can do that. Sure. That'd be great. Thank okay. you. Yep. Thank great. you. And just on that point, too, I think uh, this is a topic that obviously, as Dr. Morris mentioned, has come up at the regional level. Uh, we want to make sure we keep floating it for the Amherst School Committee, mm -hmm. even though there's no decisions to be made right now, but just, you know, future updates uh, mm -hmm. to be brought back for this committee and also for the community if they want to engage at this level, because this is one of those things that we don't want it to surprise anybody. <laughs> you know, it comes along and it's, it's a really big deal and it's going to have an impact on a lot of folks um, and their families and students, obviously. So we just want to make sure that, you know, people are fully aware and that we're bringing this up as often as we can. So perhaps not, you know, any time in the very near future, but um, sometime in the late summer or something, we can look to just get a quick update from you, much in the same way, Dr. Morris, if that's okay with you. I think that would be great. Just one other thing to share is that um, <coughs> one of the things I've been pleased with with the early response to the request for participation has been, it's been a relatively equal number of elementary and secondary parents, right. elementary and secondary staff who have volunteered to be a part of this. Um, and we're intentionally um, having um, elementary and secondary building-based administrators as part of the um, steering committee because we think it's, it, it's not, well, it's a regional, it's come through the region and mm -hmm. we really want it to have more voices in so, um, because that's the point of the, the study. Great. Yeah, I would actually, I would really welcome at a future uh, Amherst School Committee meeting, whether it's the next one or whatever's appropriate, mm -hmm. um, having you update us on, and when I say composition of the committee, I don't mean literally tell us all the names, yeah. but when you have the composition and the breakdown of the composition between folks who are more closely associated with the elementary level and the, re and the regional um, level, um, and maybe even different kinds of roles that they have, mm -hmm. and then if, as you're getting it, and if you have it, like, if this were like a, for sake of argument, a late May, early June meeting discussion item, if by then you had a sense of how you're exploring <coughs> some of the academic and programmatic issues that are associated at the, obviously for this venue in particular, the elementary level for those those students, um, it would be great just to hear it so that as people entered into the summer, um, forgive me for saying this, but again, like always, the rumor mill goes around about how is the decision being made, who's involved, what are they really looking at, is this driven by the middle school, is it driven is it really looking at it from organically from perspective of what sixth grades are experiencing or fifth and sixth graders? Um, knowing that by the end of the year, this year, we could at least lay, be informed and then lay out how that's being done, I think would be really helpful because just even, not to sound funny about this, but even though you mentioned sort of almost as an afterthought that you've gotten really robust outreach from both the elementary level and the regional level for participation, I wouldn't even put that as an afterthought. I think that's that's like that's a really important thing for people to know right out in that's front. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That we can do that. Great. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Uh, so moving us along, the next item on the agenda is uh, discussion of infectious disease policy and procedures. Um, I know it's not going to be a surprise to the committee <laughs> or to anyone watching uh, that there have been a, there's been a lot of concern raised uh, and rightfully so among many different communities, including this one, about some of the measles outbreaks that we have had. Uh, but also just uh, more generally, I think uh, thinking about our you know our policies on this topic uh, because it is in the news so much and because we know that there are some long-term impacts, uh, public health impacts, in our schools. Um, around vaccination 
um, and you know, sort of related discussions. So, uh, Dr. Morris and I thought it made sense to put this on our agenda for tonight for discussion. Uh, we also, in reviewing, <coughs> excuse me, the policy for um, the schools on this topic, uh, it is policy JLCD, which the committee has a copy of in front of them. We realize that this has not been reviewed or approved since 1996, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, a very long time <laughs> to not have a conversation on this. So for all those reasons, it just seemed to make sense to bring this before the committee tonight. Um, you know, and I think obviously we have a protocol for, for dealing with policies like this. So I'm not intending that the committee is going to discuss this policy in particular mm -hmm. and review that. It typically would go to a policy subcommittee. Uh, but anyway, with that introduction, I will hand it over to Dr. Morris. Uh, so I really want to thank, I think it's, it is a topic that's very live. Uh, I shared with some of you that the, the area I grew up in is right now sort of the epicenter of this discussion, both from a public health perspective and actually both, and from a legal perspective. So um, I've, I've been attend, attuned to it for this area, but also attuned to it just because I have a lot of family who live, still live in the area, uh, in that area. And so I really want to thank, um, the town of Amherst and the, the nursing staff in our schools because one of the things that's been really clear long before this topic became as live as it is at the moment um, is that there's a lot of collaboration um, and that's been critically important in terms of the public health department of the town of Amherst and our local schools. So I want to start from that place that we're coming from um, an orientation of cooperation uh, which isn't always the case in every community sometimes there's a gap and I feel like we catch those gaps because of our, our, our staff, but also the town staff. So with me and people who are going to do most of the talking through what our policies and uh, what are really what our procedures are, mm -hmm. not the policies in terms of school committee policy. Um, today is Jennifer Brown, who is, uh, can you remind me of your formal title? Because I'm going to. Yeah, I'm the public health nurse for the town of Amherst. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Julie Fetterman, who is, um, works with Jennifer, uh, couldn't be here today, but was here when we were putting together the slide mm -hmm. and going through our, our <coughs> reviewing. Uh, what our procedures are. And Robin Supernot, who is the nurse at the high school, but the head nurse, lead nurse for the district, uh, also contributed to that. And I also want to introduce uh, Dr. Steve Hickman, who's yeah. our school physician in the district. Yeah, and thank you for being here tonight. And, and also Dr. Brady, who also who participated uh, and is connected to the, the this from in her role, student services. So really what we tried to do, um, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to the folks closer to the work, was kind of we had a long conversation. We said, okay, how do we, what are the buckets of work that we, we want to share with the committee and the community? So the first one's really, how do we encourage immunization participation? And we had a lot of dialogue about that because um, in Massachusetts, you can't force someone. There are these exemptions that people are able to take, uh, but we're also not neutral. It's not that we're neutral arbiters and saying, yeah, whatever you want to do, that is not the approach that we've taken uh, from a public health perspective. We've respected individuals and families' uh, desires, but we try to communicate information throughout the way. The second is how do we track? So if there was um, there is an issue, how do we track um, who is immunized and who is not, so that we have that information internally, and the nurses have that, mm -hmm. and that's important not just in terms of the most recent outbreak, which the measles thing is the thing you see on the news. It's actually always something that we need to have, we need to be able to know from a public health perspective. And then the third piece is what's the planning for the outbreak? So if there was to be uh, sort of what's going on in my old neck of the woods what would be the steps and procedures that we have. So we thought those would be like the three buckets of conversation. I do want to comment a little bit on the policy at the end, so that's probably something that um, I can take the lead on talking about, but um, I think at this I'll turn it over to uh, our folks about uh, encouraging immunization participation. So Robin, do you want to start yeah, that? Or, yeah, I'll slide, sorry. So if you want to come up over here, uh, that way the camera can get you more easily. <laughs> Sure. sort of awkward. Usually there's a microphone over here. Or just so to stand here? Just stand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so we obviously follow the regulations that the Department of Public Health sets out in collaboration with the CDC. And immunizations are required at, at registration. So when a, a student comes into registrar, we collect the immunization record from them. And we continue to review this process throughout the year. Um, Sometimes we have students come in with partial immunizations and, and we work with families to track through healthcare providers, through previous schools to, to collect the information and then we enter it into our data banks, which can tell us in a moment where students stand um, with immunization status. And the immunization requirements change as the kindergarten level and then again in seventh grade. So we spend a lot of time communicating with families, um, sometimes with translators, it can be email, via phone 
um, encouraging them to get their students immunized. If we have a student who comes new to the district with no um, health care, local health care provider, we'll work with um, Julie uh, and Jennifer at the U.S. Health Department. They have a monthly immunization clinic, and Jennifer's been great to kind of on-demand uh, immunize kids, so we're not holding them out of school, and we're getting them um, into school as soon as we can. Um, and then we collaborate with, with Dr. Hickman as needed. So there's two, um, two ways students can be in school if they're not fully immunized. And one is a religious exemption, and a family would need to write on an annual basis a statement saying that due to their sincere religious beliefs, they won't be vaccinated with a child. The other is a medical uh, exemption, which a physician needs to write stating that there's a contraindication for, for whatever health condition that student can't be vaccinated. So we do update those annually. Uh, that was starting this past fall, the Department of Public Health recommendation. Um, and then when we receive the information from the families, we then return um, correspondence to let them know that in the event of a, a vaccine preventable disease in the school, their child could face exclusion per the guidelines of the Department of Public Health. So uh, that's what we do. We spend countless hours um, working with families trying to get kids immunized because some, some of the series uh, vaccines are a series of three, so they may be getting them over several months. So that, that um, takes time, but we work on it year round. Summer school nurses collect that information as kids are registering in the summer, and then as I said, we, we process that through the year. Thing that you'd like to add? You don't need to, but I just want to give you the opportunity. Okay. Any questions before we transition to tracking mechanisms? I have a couple of questions, but I'm going to hold them until sure. we're done. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have a, a database <coughs> called SNAP for the nurses, and it's um, where we report immunizations, and they it's programmed to look at the immunization, the age of the student, the um, time between vaccines to make sure that the student is compliant. And as I said, you know, in just a minute, we can pull up a list of students who are out of compliance and students who have exemptions. Um, we also are just starting to work with um, the MIIS. It's a state database on Massachusetts immunization information system. Yeah, <laughs> right. is what it stands good. for. Well <laughs> um, and we're looking at uh, a potentially a, a coordination between our program, our software program, and the state program um, to help fill in some of the blanks as needed. But we uh, are able to look at the state system for a student who maybe is vaccinated in another area, doesn't have the records, and we can, uh, Jennifer is using that mm -hmm. currently right now, so we can work with her to get that information, um, but starting in the fall will be um, all the nurses will have access to um, that database. And as I said, we collect uh, exemptions yearly, and we do work, um, <coughs> students are not supposed to be in school on day one if they're not completely vaccinated. We do have use a grace period um, because we need to have time, honestly, to get people together, to have communication with families, set up translation if that's needed. And then at some point in the early fall, um, we work with Dr. Morris and we send out exempt, um, exclusion letters <laughs> um, telling families that their student is not in compliance for whatever vaccines and that um, we set a date, and the date we set is generally the day after an immunization clinic at the U.S. Health Department. I think the only thing I'd add is that um, the number of students, I'm always surprised, you've been doing this a mm -hmm. while, so maybe you're not, I'm always surprised at the number of students on the first day who don't have all their documents and paperwork, and mm -hmm. it really dwindles because of the good work mm -hmm. of our nurses mm -hmm. and the town. Um, so we don't exclude many students in the end. But the the, the key, had very few students. yeah, but the yeah. delta between who is um, on we on day one, how many mm -hmm. students would be theoretically mm -hmm. excluded, and where we are later mm -hmm. is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. So I just mm -hmm. want to thank you know the, the nursing staff mm -hmm. at all the schools for incredible amount of phone calls, working as you said with translators, mm -hmm. working with uh, the town, working with uh, pediatricians' offices and health offices. Mm -hmm. It's a tremendous amount of work mm -hmm. that our nursing staff does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but obviously very important work. I was just going to say, you know, we, we provide the immunization. I'm stand up, um, sorry. <laughs> um, the public health nurse, Jennifer. We provide the immunizations like Robin and like we're discussing. 
Um, we provide them, but then a big component of what we do is education to get them into a, a, a primary care provider. Mm -hmm. So we, they're here, we want them at a provider, and we're sort of in the middle. We're not just the stop. So we work hard with them getting health insurance, maybe the John Santi Health Center. Mm -hmm. And the last one was depending for our break because I know there's some questions um, oh, okay. that have come about what are the steps that are taken that, that aren't visible because knock on wood we haven't had to do with this um, at the current time, but how do we actively plan in, in ways that aren't again aren't visible but incredibly important. Yeah, yeah. And that's public health. It's a lot of hard work behind the scenes. It's invisible until something like this comes out and we love talking about what we do. So local and state health officials drill potential outbreaks. Um, that's a big component of what we do. We work under an umbrella um, from the Department of Public Health. We have the Hampshire Public Health um, Pre Preparation Coalition. We have a health and medical coordinating coalition here. We have UMass drills. So we have emergency dispensing site drills. We have the CDC come up and, and work with us. We do tabletops. We also do drills that are you know, live at the Mullen Center, and we have everyone out taking a, a role. So the second thing is we do, we do is when there is an outbreak is confirmed um, by a state epidemiologist, uh, colon, I guess, school, state, and local health officials and healthcare providers communicate and collaborate to share information gained by action plans. Massachusetts has two web-based um, surveillance and case management system. One is uh, the MIIS, the immunization system, where we can, um, we can capture information and transfer to providers. The other one that we use in the health department mostly is called MAVEN, and it's the Massachusetts Virtual Epidemiological Network. So the way that it works is that a communicable disease that's reportable gets um, the information is told to the state through either a clinical diagnosis or a laboratory value. And then that information comes out to the towns. And so that's how I get the information, what's going on in town. So from that, um, we can work um, to um, prevent outbreaks and work with the patients um, virtually, so online. And then there's epidemiologists on call. So I can call the DPH number, someone picks up, and also we have an epidemiologist right here at UMass, um, so we communicate with them. Um, the third thing is town school and state officials team to implement and continue to evaluate the plan. That's something about disease investigation. Where are we now? How is it going? Do we need to stop, get more information, and reevaluate, and then take another course? And then we communicate the plan with the community and family members. And we have all the ways of communicating. We collaborate you know, with the schools. Information goes to families. We have alerts. We have media statements. And then we can go online um, with information with links. I think that's it. Thank you. So um, I know you mentioned it's a very quick thing in the policy. Um, and I want to be conscious that it's not a policy subcommittee, but it actually is relevant to, I think. Well, we get a chance to the committee just to see if there's any questions or comments Perfect. Um, first before we do that. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if you could help, help me, um, and I guess part of this is because this is also the first public discussion we've had of this mm -hmm. subject. I just wanted to know if you could help me with our current rate of immunization, whether or not the rates of immunization at different elementary schools are satisfactory. And I guess you, I mean, without rattling through every last kind of shot a person gets, <laughs> that I recognize we could be here all evening. Um, but just if you could, that would be a wonderful thing to know. And then the second thing, I guess, would be. The, the rate at which um, families are choosing to exempt their students, uh, their children, from immunization. And I guess it, 
it's useful to know whether that's based on uh, medical advice or whether it's a matter of a religious conviction. Because um, uh, may I say that because of the obvious observation that for those, it, if you told me that there were four percent that were not immunized in a given school, but ninety nine percent of them were because of medical reasons, then you'd sort of nod your head and say, well, you know, I, I, I'm happy for those families that they're able to find that out, right? If if you found out, for the sake of argument, that it flipped the other direction and seventy percent were for um, other other reasons of conscience, then it would it would make me want to ask my next question would be, which is what kind of, when we're doing outreach, what kind of materials do we have and what um, venues do we have to try to talk to parents about the value of, of immunization? So beyond the requirement, why is this a good thing to do? Why is it a good thing to do for your child in particular, but also beyond that, why is it a good thing to do for even not your kid, but for other kids. And I know that was, a, that was three quick questions or long questions, but I wanted to throw them out there because in some ways they're sort of table setter questions about not just what are we doing in particular or how do we do it, but what's the outcome that we're right now living with. Okay, um, so I just moved this afternoon. Um, the state, the last statistics that are published um, on the DPH website are, they look at uh, immunization rates in kindergarten and then again in seventh grade. And the last rates were from the 17 18 school year. So unfortunately I didn't, um, I have numbers, I don't have um, rates, but the vast majority, we have, we have five students in the region, that's from pre-K to grade 12 that have medical exemptions. Okay. Um, of that we have, I'm gonna take a quick guess about 50 students, uh, 50 plus students that have uh, religious exemptions. That's by far um, what we're looking at. So there's probably um, 34, quick math, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the Amherst public schools mm -hmm. that have religious exemptions. And in Amherst, there's one student with a medical exemption. So by far uh, greater is the religious exemption. And the state asked us starting this fall to review all our religious exemptions and ask families to rewrite them. So at that time in the spring, we wrote to families and um, asked them to revisit the issue of immunizations and we said we were available to provide education or to consult um, the healthcare provider as needed. And uh, quite a few, to our surprise, quite a few families had stopped using the religious exemption and started vaccinating the kids. Mm -hmm. Maybe on more of a delayed schedule than um, the schedule that the state is looking at. But still, I, I feel we have a significant number, a relatively significant number of students with religious exemptions. So I have a follow-up question to that. Mm -hmm. um, and another question, kind of related. Uh, so um, for, you know, in, just in terms of, of the kinds of materials and the kind of outreach that's happening, um, are there, is there more of a concerted effort to ensure that families who, you know, state that there's a religious exemption, uh, that they are receiving follow-up calls or emails or, you know, is there, is there more of a push to try to, because I, you know, I understand we, we want to be sensitive to families right. and their reasons for right. that. Right. Um, at the same time, it also seems like there's a lot of uh, concern among various communities, not just this mm -hmm. one, about mm -hmm. the potential for an outbreak, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Um, what are what steps are we taking to kind of you know go above and beyond the normal you know protocol with this? Um, and then my other question was related to exclusions. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's what you said. So what happens to the excluded students? Right? If there, have there been any excluded students? How many, or roughly, and you know um, where do they go? Um, so when a family, when we ask the family to rewrite a religious exemption, the medical exemptions are pretty standard. There's really not a lot we can do with that. Um, we accept them at face value. We have families that uh, will have religious exemptions to one series of vaccines and not the rest of the vaccines. But um, we accept the statement that they give. Um, and then, as I said earlier, provide them information that if there was an outbreak, Mm -hmm. um, the student could potentially be excluded from school. Uh, we do encourage 
families to talk to their health care providers. I know students that are going in for um, physical exams or other issues, health care providers are also reviewing immunization records and talking to families at that point. We do have a lot of information um, from the State Department of Public Health and from the CDC about the importance of vaccines um, for your students. And as far as the, exa uh, the exclusion rate, very few students have been excluded. Um, I don't know, you know, one or two a year potentially will be excluded until they get their immunizations. And sometimes if they're excluded um, today, they, you know, they may be back, today is the date, they may be back in the afternoon after they've been to the doctor um, to get updated or, or to see Jennifer. But very few students, um, one or two a year over the years are actually um, excluded from school. And they're excluded until they get vaccinated. Just a, a quick follow-up. Do we keep track of those students? So if, if a student is excluded, um, do we, we keep you know tabs on them just until we know what, we, what has happened? We do. As, okay. as I said, sometimes it's just a matter of hours before they're back in school. But we do continue to work with families. And the only exception is students that come to our district who are homeless. We don't exclude them at all. We, we welcome them into schools. And then we work with families kind of behind the scene and uh, check through the previous school to see if they have the records or um, a previous physician's office and often can get records, facts. And if they have nothing, because we do have students coming from other countries with no vaccines at all, then we'll work with Jennifer and the health department. Or sometimes if students have kind of, if families have a connection to the university, we work with, with UMass Health Services to get children of their students vaccinated to get into our schools. Thank you. Dr. Morris, did you want to add to that? Very briefly, um, the only thing I'd add on the <coughs> students who, who potentially get excluded is the local health providers are highly aware of the date. Mm -hmm. They get many calls from our staff and from parents, and they have been wonderful in working with us. Mm -hmm. and so not that the town has it, but I know oftentimes it's, um, getting that and, and, off, and I know we've occasionally made exceptions where the doctor's office says we can't do it on Thursday, we'll do it on Friday. Mm -hmm. We work with families and their health care providers and big things knowing that there's a date, there's a time when, they're, right. when this immunization is going to happen um, and once we get confirmation of that we, we try as best we can not to exclude students from mm -hmm. school um, and, and then we've been pretty successful with that. We've been very successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there have been times, unfortunately, where um, sometimes providers have run out of the vaccine, and then we work with that too. Great. Thank you. So I do want to move us on to the conversation about the policy, and I know, Dr. Morris, you were eager to, yeah, <laughs> to share this, but are there any other just have Ms. Spitzer? One question. Yeah, I'm elected because we have somebody from the town today, so I, I understand that the school committee, so I want to focus on the schools, but I, I mean, there was recently that, um, it's that article that mentioned that the rates vary widely in terms of public schools, private schools, and since in this community we have so many of our families are coming into contact with people who aren't necessarily in the public school. Do we have any concern about the rate in the town as a whole? Um, or the, the larger community? Do you want to talk to that? I mean, um, the, the, uh, I would say yes in terms of concern. Um, in terms of what can be done about it, it's yeah. a little more difficult. Um, there are some other schools that have quite high rates of, sort of non-compliance, up to 25%. Mm -hmm. um, and there are homeschool families that, again, we don't really have much control over. I would just make a comment that I would agree completely with the exclusion. That's mm -hmm. the way it is in, in the pediatric population as mm -hmm. well. Probably less than 5% are, uh, are not immunized because of medical reasons. Mm -hmm. And 90% plus are because of religious reasons. Mm -hmm. And we, our practice actually has been uh, debating some of this because there's a move some places to not allow families that don't immunize to be a part of your practice. Mm -hmm. but we've opted not to do that, in part because of just what was mentioned, that that's an opportunity to keep talking to them. And some are, oh, I have an 18-year-old who's just started getting immunizations on his own because his family never did. And so he is actually beginning a process of getting immunized. So that can happen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Nakajima. Sorry, yeah. just quality quick. Yeah. I apologize. Um, I don't know who I'm really directing this to. It could be the superintendent or to the town. Um, I, so 
Uh, I remember distinctly when I was a kid, there were all sorts of TV commercials and stuff on around getting immunized. And when I look, think back to that era, because obviously it's too little to remember, you know, it, was, it wasn't that long, like after vaccinations became widespread and really common. And I think there was probably a lot of a really broad level understanding because vaccinations were like this miracle that reduced infant mortality enormously as well as long-term debilitating conditions that were preventable. The point is they're preventable. And so my guess is if you go back 30 or 40 or 50 years, the, there was a broader widespread understanding of this sort of really neat miracle of vaccines and how every micro decisions that individual families make not only benefit their kids, but also benefit a broader community and that it grows over time. And I think when you have people making what seem microdynamic decisions around not immunizing their kids, if the vaccination rates are up at 98%, they may not be creating any risk for others. They might be posing some risk for themselves, but not for others. And it's only when you start chipping away at that percentage that all of a sudden you're creating a broader public health challenge that exists beyond the kid. And, and so, and so I, I, I say all this because I would never want to have a situation in which we, we encountered families in a way that was anything less than respectful um, around who they are, what their beliefs are, and how they're coming to that conversation. But it seems to me that we need to do much, much more than we are around re-engaging our community and populace around what like, vaccines even are, how they work, and how they benefit. And just, you know, I don't know who, I don't know how, I don't know who that'll end up affecting. You suggested that there were actually folks who are having this conversation already of re-engaged and getting vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll stop except for to say, if this is sort of the end of our conversation about this tonight, I, I really passionately believe as we're ending this school year and looking at the next, we should be thinking about what more we can do and what more we should do to raise the level of dialogue and education around the value of vaccines. And not, again, in a polemical way, but literally just explaining to people the science and how, how what they do and the choices they're making can benefit their child and many people beyond them. And the State Department of Public Health. Um, you know, Thank you. The State Department of Public Health looks at pockets across the state, and there's a pocket um, of low vaccine rates in Berkshire County, in Southern Franklin County, out in Dukes County, out in the islands. And so their plan is also to provide additional educational information to providers and families out there. That's something that they're working on this spring to raise the immunization rates in those communities. Looking forward to hearing also mm -hmm. about that here, if there's mm -hmm. any opportunity for that as well. Dr. Morris, did you want to? Yeah, I could be very brief, and, and, and um, the Superdot actually alluded to this, but in terms of the policy, um, so I did look it up. It's based on, it is literally word for word, as general law. Um, that's the reference, but it's, um, what's in italics is literally still the law. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing that perhaps is a little misleading uh, about the law and thus the policy is that uh, there are two exceptions. One was the one that, that Mr. Supernaut mentions, and the Mahiti Mental Law, which governs homeless students, um, provides an exception for this. So if a student comes to us and is um, with the legal definition of homeless status, um, then this doesn't apply mm -hmm. in that scenario. And the other one is when we've taken uh, families, families come, I should say, um, leaving, for instance, the most recent one was Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, the clear guidance was students are enrolled in school regardless of, you know, and that was some practical reality about how we can find immunization records given the state of uh, what was happening, uh, the national disaster in Puerto Rico. Um, so I think the only thing to note is that the law, the first sentence of the says no child should be admitted to school except, but it really doesn't include the exceptions that are actually legally based that, you know, potentially conflict with this law. So uh, perhaps for the policy subcommittee to, to mm -hmm. look into, but um, the, this is still the text of the law. The law hasn't changed since 1996, but the Bikini Vento and some of those other pieces sort of supersede the, this particular law in isolated, say, cases, and, and not so isolated because the Bikini Vento in our district we have a, a, a fair number of students who um, have status as homeless. Okay. So. so it does sound like a good opportunity then, though, to send this to the, the policy subcommittee, at least for review, right? To be able to say that we've reviewed it, you know, that, and, and bring that back to the committee for 
a vote in approval. Um, you know, it may be that the policy subcommittee decides that they don't want to make any changes to this and that this is fine the way it is. Um, but I think it's probably worth a conversation. And, you know, I see some nodding heads here. So it looks like the, the committee agrees. Yeah. Great. I agree. Okay. Well, uh, unless there's anything else, any other comments or questions from the committee, um, I think we'll move on this topic. Yeah, thank thank you, you so much for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. It was really, really helpful to hear. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving us on to the next item on the agenda, it's a uh, dual language update. And Dr. Morris, is this you or? This is, uh, I'll do a quick introduction. introduction as Ms. Richardson is getting it set up is we have a lot of you know positive exciting uh, things to share and I think we did a lot of the heavy lifting of talking about this actually dating back to last summer I was thinking back at summer we had a number of summer meetings if you might remember yeah. about zoning and and so the neat thing for me first of all is that Ms. Richardson, um, Ms. Chamberlain, a number of others are just the work is coming to fruition uh, thanks to their hard work but also some of the deep dialogue we had about wanting to have the right enrollment rates and all that is, is actually uh, really beneficial the feedback we received from the committee in those dialogue. Uh, now that it's a reality, it's, um, I think the feedback that I'm receiving and that when we have our conversations is having those things discussed well ahead of time really paid off in terms of where we are and what we're doing and some good news on staffing um, to share as well. But I'll, I'll turn it over to Ms. Richardson. Okay. So just a couple points. Um, there's lots and lots of things going on, but um, thanks for having me here. I'll just highlight a couple things and you can ask what else you're curious about. Um, so one big piece was we did choose a foundational curriculum that we're going to use for the dual language program. Um, and the, the curriculum team, which was a subcommittee of the dual language planning group, so there's different folks tackling different things. Uh, we looked at three options in depth, had publishers come and reviewed materials and offered those materials to the school community and the families to look at and respond to. Um, and the team chose the National Geographic Panorama as the sort of backbone of the curriculum. Um, and I listed the reasons there. Um, they're really beautiful, engaging materials. They really attend to diversity and social justice in terms of the content, who's represented, um, and the kinds of topics that are covered. Um, I should say this is a reading through science and reading through social studies um, curriculum, the way that it's framed. So it really aligns well to the standards in both um, reading and then in our content areas for unit study. And let's say, so it's equitable and available in both languages. Um, everything is there to be able to work across um, topics in both English and Spanish. The school in general has been interested in and looking to move towards a more thematic approach of language and content together. So this will really support that piece. Another piece that the team really liked is that our teachers have a lot of expertise and they really want autonomy and flexibility. And so some of the other options we looked at, well, they had more stuff they felt too scripted or too basally or too, you know, too kind of confining in the way that they laid things out. And this gives us an opportunity to really map the curriculum how we want, um, do more project-based learning, and build in other pieces that we want to see. I yeah. Think, do you want to add just the, about you know across all three classrooms? Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. that's a more of a Yeah. So we've talked about um, originally we were thinking really of just purchasing a Spanish curriculum, and we've shifted that thinking because we don't want to feel like the dual language program is separate from the rest of the school. That conversation came up a bunch with this group, I think, in the fall, and we've continued to think about that and feel like we want the Spanish and the English teacher within dual language, but also the monolingual classroom to all be able to collaborate and plan across. So this move will be um, across the kindergarten, and we're actually looking at including the first grade team and hopefully getting them on board to start using these materials as well while we're doing the planning and PD and all of that around that so that there can be some unified efforts. Um, so I think that's really exciting because it does get everybody on board. And teachers were excited about the work that this will take 
Um, so that's the only thing that I, I mentioned at the bottom is that it does require a significant amount of work because it's not basally and it doesn't come with all the pieces. But that's where our teacher expertise um, is going to come into play to put the pieces together. Um, something that was interesting for our team is that the rigor of the texts that come with this program are really high um, in a way that is exciting and in a way that we know will need to be balanced by level text at students reading level. So that was an interesting piece to look at, just the way different curriculum approach that. Um, if there's a lot of research around giving students really high grade level text and at the same time beginning readers, especially in kindergarten, need to start from the foundations. So I think we're looking at how to provide for both of those needs. And the last piece I'll say there is that the phonics uh, decision was to continue with Super Kids in English for all students and to add the Spanish component just for the phonics instruction. And we're looking at, uh, you know, two, the two of the curriculums in the bottom are the two most commonly used yep. um, Spanish language phonics. And, and you can't, it's not really, a, just because the phonics system is completely different, there's not like, oh, you can buy this in English and this in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the phonics, the subset of phonics is, is different. So they right. are unique. You wouldn't want a translated quote unquote version for a whole host of reasons. But right. students would learn some English or Spanish if you did that. Yeah. So we're looking to make that decision um, soon. Soon, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Both are really strong options, so we're not. I'm not feeling worried about it. It's just we have to make a final decision. So, so just have a quick question for you sure. on the curriculum because it's a new curriculum. Mm -hmm. What kind of evaluation are you guys working into? You know, um, just to help decide a year from now, two years from now, whether mm -hmm. this is actually being successful, right? Like, you know, what does that look like? Yeah, I, mean, I think like any curriculum, it's an ongoing conversation, right? So we can't. We hope that we'll love it and we'll be able to use it for a long time. Um, but we're going to have to continue to, with all the assessments we normally use with students, to see you know, how is this working, and, um, what do we need to shift, what do we need to add. So, yeah. I think the particular challenge to that on this front, and that's why I appreciate Katie's work with MABE, is that the, the curve of language acquisition is different in a dual language program versus right. a monolingual program. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about that multiple times here. Um, so when for the modeling of English class, we would expect a different curve than we would for the dual language program, particularly in kindergarten and first grade. Right. Um, so I know that there's some work going on at MABE about norming, you know, the expected growth that you would see. Well, that's kind of my, I guess my Absolutely. question yeah. is really, you know, how does, because yeah, we're not going to have the expertise in that, you know, and I don't expect mm -hmm. you guys to come up with the answer right away, but other folks have been studying this for a while and, and doing this work. You know, they must have a sense of what is "quote unquote" normal or you know, or expected progress anyway. And if yes. there's, you know, reasons to catch something or change something. Right. Absolutely. So we do have um, resources in terms of Mabe and other districts that have been collecting that data longer. We're also looking really carefully at what are the assessment points we're going to use in both languages. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of thinking about that right now. All the way starting with kindergarten screening. How do we start to think about that for class placement for next year? Um, through how are we going to assess well, right, but not over assess next mm -hmm. year and continue to have useful benchmarks that help us really help inform instruction. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also partnering with some folks at UMass around that to help think through that piece. So, so this is kind of a related question. Um, and you may be getting to it next for all I know on the next slide. But um, how are you building in moments for collaboration? amongst teachers in the fall to, so one question is, what, how's the curriculum doing? But my guess is if this is a really good um, set of materials, the real question is gonna be is how are we optimizing the, the teaching of it, right? <laughs> like yes. the actual work of translating mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And so part of that's assessing what's going on with the kids, but part of it's also building in, I assume, mm -hmm. building in time for the teachers to have checkpoints and reflection moments and sort of think about what have I been learning, what's been working, what hasn't been working. Yeah. How are you thinking of that, about that sort of question? So there's a couple layers, I guess. One mm -hmm. is to have some support from Mabe to do some curriculum mapping and looking at how do we kind of divide up, you know, when we're in a unit about whatever topic, what happens in English, what happens in Spanish, how do we think about that. Um, but then there's the day-to-day -day schedule or the week-to-week, -week really. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the principals at Fort River are working really hard on the schedule right now to figure out how do we get more team time, right? So we need to have our individual planning time for those teachers um, as usual, but then we also need 
time for the partner teachers, we're calling them, right? Not co-teachers, but the partner teachers to work together. Mm -hmm. um, and then the team of everybody that's working with these students. So they're looking at a weekly additional planning time. Um, and we're th that's all in the works, but we'll sh we can share, you know, kind of how that teases out. Mm -hmm. We're looking at some flexibility with specials options to provide some time for that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I can't see your face. <laughs> um, so, um, so this may be getting way ahead of ourselves, but I do want to acknowledge that we have this state of interest that's gone forward. And other than that, you know, I'm just seeing some potential dominoes. So, like adopting this curriculum, impacting the non dual language program at Fort River, and then in five or so many years, potentially. This is all really far down the road, but then yeah. it could also spill over potentially into affecting all of the first graders who are in whatever, wherever, however the, the future school is. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if there's been any thought given to that piece of this, because if, if, if the curriculum changes that are happening to enable the dual language to go really well, and we love these books, that's wonderful, but it also has the potential to trickle down or overflow into um, the other areas, and that could be negative if they don't go really well. Yeah. Well. yeah. Yeah. So I think we've had brief conversations. This really goes back to what we'll be on the agenda next time, which is some of the strategic planning work that happened particularly at Wilder and Crocker Farm and mm -hmm. how, how much flexibility do we want to offer and autonomy uh, for schools and what do we need to be consistent. So we do have those conversations with principals um, so that the people are aware. I think it is, in my opinion, an opportunity uh, and I, you know I hate the word pilot, um, so I'm not going to use it here, but I think some of the benefits of the concept of piloting something is that you do get first-hand experience from students, from staff, from families about how something's going. I wouldn't call this a pilot because this is not like, oh, we're going to try National Geographic. No, the panorama curriculum out. Uh, but I think it will give us some, some first-hand experience of how that's worked because all three of the elementary schools, and you've heard this, are looking at how do we have more integrated um, uh, project-based curricula. And if this is something that's separate from dual language programming, we're finding is really successful, then there is an opportunity to have that conversation at a Right. Yeah, I would just add that we um, we know that our curriculum is not currently well aligned to the new science and social studies standards. Mm -hmm. So that's work that has to happen across the district. So it is kind of a cool opportunity to say, well, let's see how this works to address some of that. What do we like? What do we not? What do we have to build in? Um, so a couple pieces on staffing and professional development. Our kindergarten Spanish teacher has been hired, which is wonderful. Um, we're all, you know, <laughs> starting to feel like, okay, it's, it's still early in the hiring season, but it'd be really great. So that's, that's good news. Um, and we feel really excited about her. Um, and then the next steps for hiring, we're looking for our bilingual special education teacher, um, the paraeducator for the Spanish classroom will be hired and that um, there are lots of folks within our district and without, um, you know, so that's a, that should be not too difficult. Uh, maybe the difficulty would be that too many good people, <laughs> if anything. Um, and then we're also looking at having a permanent substitute position so that when, that is bilingual, so that when somebody out, is out in the Spanish classroom, we're not sacrificing Spanish instructional time um, for that piece. So yeah, and if I could add just briefly to that. Yep. Um, so this is looking at um, having a substitute paraeducator position. We do have that right. in some of the secondary schools. Mm -hmm. There's just frankly, there's enough people out on a daily basis where there's never like, oh yeah, everyone's here and there's no need for a sub in those days of few and far between the school the size of Fort Rivers with the staff the size of Fort Rivers. Um, most typically what happens in most kindergarten classrooms is when the teacher's out, the paraeducator takes over for the teacher and this mm -hmm. would be providing uh, a bilingual paraeducator for the classroom so that <coughs> the, the class remains fully staffed with, and vice versa, the, the paraeducator that's assigned to kindergarten is out that, that we don't lose, um, there's no loss of instruction uh, or instructional support in those classrooms. Yeah. Um, Specifically in Spanish, because we just yeah. know it's easy to lead, you know, blend towards more English throughout yeah. the day. So. Um, yeah. I think the only thing I'll add without getting, you know, I respect the confidentiality of, of, of staff. It's just we're excited about the person we hired. Um, I haven't met them just at the tail end as it usually happens, but I heard wonderful things. And um, there was both an interview and a, a mock lesson um, that was taught so people got to see teaching. And it's someone who's, um, I know because this came up, I'm going back to conversations we had a while back, 
is a native Spanish speaker, um, but has taught both in Puerto Rico and in Texas, and in Texas in a dual language program. So um, not only do we think this person will be a great fit for us here, but also the person who has some institutional programmatic information that is going to be incredibly important as we move forward, separate from her work with the different students that she's teaching. So yeah, yeah I'm very excited. Yes. Um, so then the piece below is connected to going back to the grant that we received um, between Holyoke and Amherst, and one of the big components of that work was partnering with UMass to create a bilingual education program. We're finally at the place of recruiting teachers for that, which is great. Um, UMass and the Department of Education are a little more slow moving than we like sometimes, but they're both really trying to help us out and make this work within a really tight time frame of the grant. Um, Guidelines. So we're looking at a 15 credit program that will be offered to a cohort of 12 teachers between Amherst and Holyoke um, to provide them with uh, the bilingual education endorsement for those who need it, which are those who are teaching in Spanish, or a bilingual education certificate program for those who will be teaching on the English side but still should be gaining the same knowledge and skills. Um, so I'm really excited about that That's opportunity exciting. too. And it's largely paid for by the grant, so That's great. yeah. I think it's also worth mentioning that these programs don't exist across the state. I mean, I think if you we're like the second one to get approval. Exactly. With UMass. So um, we're very fortunate to have UMass partners so close because, um, you know, frankly, uh, there's not many places yeah. to do it, and the likelihood of the geography would work out as nicely as it is is mm -hmm. it's really a testament to the UMass College of Education working for Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that'll be a great, um, you know, the first group. We'll go through the program now, but the program will exist, and so we'll be able to kind of grow more of our educators who are interested in that work you know, going forward. So enrollment is the other update. So of the 88 families that we have kindergarten registered for kindergarten at this point, um, just over the whole district, 47 were interested in dual language. Um, and then the numbers are there for what the enrollment looks like so far. So we have nine families who are within the Spanish-speaking or bilingual group, um, 18 families that are zoned for Fort River that are English speakers, and 20 that are within the Crocker Farm or Wildwood districts um, that are interested English speakers. So our next steps are the lotteries coming up next Monday. We're reaching out to families this week to confirm that the, um, with a little bit more information, that they're really interested, just to kind of say, here's what this really means, and here are the benefits, and here are the challenges, and what does that look like, and do you want to talk about it? Um, so that when we go into the lottery, people really feel like they're committed and excited and you know, know what, what they're talking about. Because um, it's, you know, it's a new model for people. There's a lot of excitement, which is great, and we want to make sure that people are really thoughtful about it. Um, and another reason for that is that there is so much interest across the, the other school zones that we don't want to have a seat for a Fort River family that then says, actually, if we don't want that seat. We'd rather start to um, offer it to other folks if, if not everybody would like to participate. Um, I, think just, I think it's worth yeah. mentioning, it's not explicit on your slides, but <coughs> that they've also had a number of opportunities. We've had office hours, we've yeah. had different department I know there's... Yeah, yeah. You know, well, and I'll mention that too with the outreach. But absolutely, yeah. but just in terms of the email that went to families, it was also an invitation to an additional office hour, so it's not only relying on electronic and phone communication. There's been mm -hmm. opportunities, and there will continue to be opportunities for families who have yeah. questions before they want to, you know, commit to having a child in it. Mm -hmm. Park, so. yeah, I know you. Absolutely. I know that's on your outreach, but I think it's relevant. Yeah, no, that's true. As well. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the lottery will happen, but what we've let families know is essentially that anyone in groups one or two is automatically in the lottery because of the numbers at this time, uh, and we'll hold 20 seats. So the remainder of the seats will be held through August 1st as we continue to do more outreach. We do have a lot of that that has happened, and a lot more that's coming up. Um, we've been connected with LSSE to go to some of their events. We've been to in communication with um, various preschools, um, outreach to regional community action and Head Start, and um, just everywhere we can find that there are folks who will listen and, and want to hear more. So I think that process will, you know, I feel optimistic that we'll, we'll get a lot closer to 20 because I think there are so many folks that we haven't reached. Um, and. Yeah. yeah I mean, well, as of last week, I can't speak for if anything happened in the last three days. Mm -hmm. um, 
but um, out of the families that were identified as being either bilingual or predominantly Spanish speaking, all of them registered for the program. So that mm -hmm. might have changed last week, it's possible, right. but I think it's just worth noting yep. um, that it's not, that was one of our concerns was um, will, will there be additional barriers for families um, who's mm -hmm. native languages, Spanish, uh, for a whole host of reasons, and I think the average that your team's done and Jujera Torres, who I think deserves lots of Mm -hmm. commendation and praise uh, as the key registrar for the elementary schools at the moment yeah. um, to try to work through and answer questions as they come up is really important. Yeah, and it's been exciting that just in conversations I've had with families to say, you know, how do you feel about this? Or you have a three-year-old who's coming up, but what do you think? And, you know, your other students go to different school. How do you feel about that? And um, we've had a lot of, of folks who feel like, no, it's okay as long as they're getting the bus there and I understand and I feel like it's really valuable. So I'm excited to talk about it. Um, so really, just in terms of the lottery, the, the true lottery will be for um, students in Group 4. And if we have any students who register after the initial enrollment period in Group 3, um, I don't believe we have many at this point. But um, So that lottery will essentially set up a list, a numbered list of where are you on the wait list. So you know, maybe two families would get in at this point, but if we have openings, then we would let folks know. So we can, at, you know, after the lottery, we'll let them know where they are so they have a sense of likelihood. Ms. Bissell, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to make sure I understand this right. So there are nine families who have registered from groups one and two, and those mm -hmm. are all of the families you've currently identified as the bilingual or Spanish speaking who we know of now. Yes. So, but we're holding 11 seats for until yes. the end of the, the summer mm -hmm. for those students. So, how confident are you that we'll find 11 bilingual, or, I mean, because it seems like we always have this goal of having the 50-50. Um, are you a little concerned or about having a different mix than what we had hoped for? I think as long as we end up in the ballpark, we'll be okay. I mean, I think there's, there's a couple layers, right? There's the biggest issue in terms of the program makeup is just do we have enough Spanish-speaking models to have a true two-way bilingual program? Um, I, I feel like usually, in, from the patterns we've seen historically, we do have folks registering over the summer mm -hmm. really consistently, and that our average numbers of Spanish speakers um, across the three schools, are, it was between 15 and 25 in each year over the last five years. Um, so, I, you know, I don't feel concerned that we'll be much below, we may be a little bit below. Yeah, yeah I would agree with that. I think, um, you know, so we'll have more than 88 kindergarten students next year. Right. Um, and so, you know, well, we do all the outreach we can for kindergarten enrollment during the three days that we have it set up. This is a really typical pattern. Actually, this is a higher enrollment number than we had last year, um, and we have a lot more than 80 kindergartners this year. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that that's likely to be the case, and based on the past patterns, as, as Mr. Richardson said, um, this is, this is, if this if you told me two months ago this is where we are, I'd say, okay, that's actually sort of in the zone of what would be predictable. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that I feel best about is the, the percentage of families in groups one and two who opted into the program, because that would be a harder problem mm -hmm. um, to solve. Um, but so far, so good on that mm -hmm. yeah. So um, looking at the group three in particular, so the, the families that are zoned to Fort River that are choosing not to um, to enroll in mm -hmm. or register for the lottery. Mm -hmm. um, are, is there concern that that's going to be too large a number for one classroom? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I no. don't think so. And that's no. the majority. Um, last time I checked, there were, I think it was like 10 students who were zoned to Fort River who opted not to be a part of this. I think um, it was less, yeah. You think it's less than 10? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was really small to begin with, which is great because oh, we don't want it to. Oh, including the right. number one. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm right. not math wrong. Right, not including the first. I think it was five or six yeah. in the initial enrollment. Yeah. So, of course, we'll get Thank more, mm -hmm. but that's great. We need the space for those folks who don't want to be in the language as well. Yeah. So. Thank you for that reminder. Yeah. And I think um, the other thing to note, well, it's not, I mean, I'm making a, a small hypothesis that's related to this agenda topic is, this was the highest number of registrants we've had for Fort River during the enrollment period. 
and since the redistricting in 2010. Um, so typically that has the lowest, as you know, we've went over enrollments, it's the smallest elementary, K to six elementary school right now. Um, and um, it was at the end of the three day uh, registration period, it, it had the most number of uh, enrolled kindergarten students for next year. Um, so my hypothesis is this might have something to do with it. I don't have evidence, it's one year, like there's a whole number of factors, maybe there's a lot of kids in Echo Hill or Amherst Woods, right? So it's hard to come to broad conclusions, but it was a changing pattern that we've had for nine years in a row, or eight years in a row. And we've yeah. talked about the fact that there's a lot of interest and excitement around this program. There has been for quite some time growing up, I think, you know, much to your credit for, for you know, pushing this out there and continuing to bring it up and talk about it. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if that's actually what's, you know, what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm conscious of the time yep. because yep. this was actually slated for just 10 minutes and yep. we've now gone to almost 30. So. That's all I've got. <laughs> Unless you want to ask uh, more. Yeah. yeah. So I think the only thing to note is that Mabe's continued to be a willing and interested partner. Um, you know, they've asked us to attend a conference at the end of next month about um, basically how to start a dual language program that's mm -hmm. high quality um, on without breaking the bank. Because um, we've tried to do things not only from the grant, but we've tried to do things with our own staff and, and how that's worked. So um, they could be partners with us and we're happy to get back to them because they are interested in promoting dual language education across the region. Um, so I think just worth the committee knowing that um, they picked us in one other district to meet with them. And the Congratulations. Um, and I just want to mention, mention one, we'll say something about outreach uh, before and just struck um, just a reminder in my mind. Mm -hmm. I think you know, if there's anything that the committee can do to also help promote those remaining 11 seats, um, and I know that the community has expressed an interest in doing that as well, mm -hmm. you know, let's take advantage of all of those different networks that we have and that people, you know, uh, typically use to spread the word around this, and especially, you know, for Spanish speakers in the community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's worth uh, going that extra mile to try to, you know, Absolutely. share those things with them. Yep, yeah. I'm happy to share awesome. any, you know, any information or ideas. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Uh, okay, so moving us on, the next item on the agenda is ADA update and capital update. Uh, so I'll start with the ADA piece and I don't know if Sean or someone at JC, who is on JCPC wants to share more on the capital. Um, so, um, so um, the, the, sorry, there's so many notes as people talked about it pretty deep in the packet. Um, but there's two documents that I wanted to share with the committee. Um, I would have ordered them, well, we'll start the way it is organized. So the first one at the top says ADA Audit Prioritization Financial Summary. So um, this was um, organized, um, it took the, the report from KMA and Rupert uh, Roy Clark tried to make it a little more condensed and, and perhaps easier to understand. Uh, but really some of the work KMA did was twofold. One was to try to look at what they listed as areas of noncompliance and organize them, but what could be done in-house. There's, there's labor costs of our own that we pay, so you know, there's only so many things that our staff can do, but things that can be done. Uh, what single trade cost? Um, and so those are things that are a little easier to done. It might involve um, working with an outside vendor, but it doesn't involve you know a large project. And then the complicated ones. Um, so you know, if you think about filling in a well that's in a library, right? Like you know, ones that involve like closer to what we would call construction. Mm -hmm. You know maybe lower KC, but true. A contractor know. team, perhaps. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a really helpful way to look through it. The second thing that KMA did is they held three, they held three um, meetings for users. So anyone in the community was involved. I know CPAC was well represented, as well as our administrative team, to represent what they hear from staff and from um, students and families. And they were all invited, but the, the staff did, our, our principals in particular, did a great job of taking that information. Um, so I think perhaps it's worth um, skipping to the third page of KMA's report where it says preliminary recommendations, because that's what I'd like to share. Um, so, so that's on page three? Yep, yeah. exactly. Um, some of this has already been done like for, for number one. Uh, what Rupert did is he uh, assigned one of three complexity categories to, to the barriers, um, you know, the ones that can be done by our maintenance staff, the ones that are straightforward, but 
plumber, electrician, one trade, um, and then one that would involve you know additional study. And I think that's a key phrase. Is you know, they put a price tag as a rough placeholder, but would involve you know another place when they say, yeah, this is what it would cost to, to fill in a well in the library. Um, and really, they, they tried to help us with what would a, what a plan might look like um, in the three different complexity categories and try to understand the user and prioritize not just based on what's easiest to be done, but also what has the most bang for the buck in terms of the user needs. And that's where principles were helpful in thinking about it. Um, and you can see that the user concerns, I'm sorry, I'm just going to run out of it, but on page two, um, this is across all the schools in the district. You can see that this is what came from the users, both parents, mm -hmm. guardians, um, and then principals about the largest barriers uh, that they hear about uh, affecting the experience of, of students and families. Um, so what we're in the process of doing, once JCPC wraps up, is, uh, which I think is pretty close, but we'll hear about in a second, is uh, look, working with the dollar amount that um, potentially will be assigned to us and offered to us by the town, and then having another deep cut on how to take all the information that both the user feedback, the prioritization, looking at what staff capability is, particularly as the summer months when some of this work really needs to happen when mm -hmm. students and staff aren't as present, uh, and coming up with a detailed list with you, you know, likely next month of what we'd recommend for um, what potentially it looks like from the capital plan, $100,000 uh, to spend on ADA compliance as a, as a next step. So we wanted to present just the report that KMA did to you, talk about the work, and come back next month with a more detailed, articulated um, draft of something for you to respond to. Great. I just want to give a, a, a just a quick uh, chance for um, the members here who served on the JCPC if they want to add anything to this or if there's any in initial responses. You don't have to. Okay. Ms. Spitzer? Um, I'm just noticing that Wildwood's excluded both on page two and then on the ADA prior, or audit prioritization finally. Financial summary, excuse me. Yeah. And um, Rupert calls that out. Um, and I think it is worth finding out why that was included. And I, I think just want to make sure that I'm talking this. Sure, we didn't have as much uh, user feedback from on at school for. I. We should do something about that. Whatever reason. <laughs> um, I think what uh, what I've talked about with the principals is that Fort River School, while not identical, is pretty close. Mm -hmm. And trying to see if. You know, even those two reports, if you remember looking at them, there were very minor variations in those ADA reports, but they were much more similar or much more analogous than, you know, comparing them to Crocker Farm or any of the other schools. So trying to see if the same challenges at Fort River are the case at Wildwood, there's a different student population, so we want to be really conscious that even if they're the same issues, the different student population because of different specialized programs may affect the user piece more, but we definitely need more outreach at Wildwood, so I want to acknowledge that point. But we didn't have as much feedback. I'm happy to help if there's any room. Yes, there and is. I dangerous will. words to offer, but um, yeah, we'll know. take you up on that. <laughs> Mr. Nakajima? Yeah, I, I guess it probably is worth saying a couple things about JCPC, and if Ms. McDonald or Ms. Mangano have something to add or correct what I'm saying, please do. That um, A, we did talk about this at JCPC. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the members of the JCPC I think we shared a question that members of our committee had of trying to make sure that particularly for Wildwood and Fort River, we're looking to replace those buildings sooner rather than later. How do we think about prioritizing mm -hmm. investments that um, aren't overly expensive and essentially can with help with the accessibility but not you know, have sunk costs that can't be recovered later? Um, but I think beyond that, um, my recollection is that there was a lot of support for the basic requests that are being put forward by um, our schools, including the ADA investments. All right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, agree. Great. It's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you for that. I, you know, um, it's really helpful, I think, to just get these uh, regular updates in front of the committee just to hear, you know, the, the conversations as they're moving along. I would be curious also uh, how we can get some input from Wildwood um, sooner rather than later because these things seem to have a life of their own and once they get put forth out there, you know, um, and money starts to, actually hard money starts to get appropriated and discussed, we don't want to, uh, you know, have a community feel like they've been left out uh, inadvertently or, you know, um, or just because of the process. Mm -hmm. So it'd be great if we can at the next you know, update at least have an update on that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. 
so if there's nothing else on that, uh, moving us on to the third quarter budget update, and I think this is Mr. Mondano. So I guess the first part, they can hear us without microphones? They can hear no us, so there's a mic that's pointed at us uh, from the camera over here. Okay. <laughs> but just speak loudly, please. I will, <laughs> especially if we start singing again. Outdoor voice. Go through that. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's worth noting that this is a, a welcome for Senegalese and Gambian students okay. in the cafeteria. So that's the, the, the music that we're hearing. Music yes. we're hearing. Yeah. It's a regional <laughs> of it. It was nice hearing like things in the back. Yeah. I, I think it creates a statement that um, there's an element of self-sacrifice on our parts because it's obviously that's much more fun than <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Absolutely. So with that note, third that quarter budget report. No, you're great. Right. Right. So yes. <laughs> present company is a lot of fun. I'll, I'll move through. Um, so this is the most important <laughs> quarterly budget report because it's at the most information as we go the fourth quarter, mm -hmm. which at that point things are too late to, to act on. Um, so few changes from last time, which I'll point out, and I'll, I'll go through the highlights. So with three months remaining, the Amherst Public Schools are projected to finish under budget due to savings and health insurance. Um, salaries are projected 101,000 over budget, so that's one area that's changed. If you look back at your Q2 report, we were under budget at that point, and payroll, uh, I'll point out the principal of the last uh, item that shifted out. Um, so the items that haven't changed much are the vacant instructional coach, um, that's a savings the position that hasn't been filled out here. Um, a vacant special educator, or special education paraeducator position. Um, the additional custodial position that we added in response to the summer um, facility issues that we had. Um, the new thing is the shift of the IDA grant funds. You may recall one of the initiatives we've been working on this year, and as part of the FY20 budget, is really two things. One, it's to better align our IDEA grant among the three districts. Out, out of, over time, it's sort of gone out of whack in terms of how much it supports the elementary district, how much it supports the secondary district in Pella. Um, so this is helping align that better. And the other piece is we're trying not to pay for positions as much out of that grant. Because when you pay for positions, especially the particular teaching positions, you have to earmark some additional funds for retirement that you normally would not have to. Um, so it actually reduces the amount of spendable funds you have from that grant. Um, so we're trying to find other sources, other things to pay for from the grant. Um, so one of the things we're looking to pay for is ex um, extended year programming costs for the summer. Those aren't positions, it's basically the, the teachers in Paris who run the special education summer program, uh, but they're, they're stipended positions. Mm -hmm. So that's the big change in payroll that's flipped it from a, a, a savings in payroll to an overage in payroll. Uh, in contracted services, there was a deficit in Q2, it's gotten a little bit worse. Um, extended, uh, special education extended year services, so it's sort of a funny thing. So this, the grant that we're shifting to cover extended year services, we're shifting it to cover this coming summer, extended year services, so it's FY20, because it's mm -hmm. July and August. This past summer is over budget. Um, so next year it won't be over budget because the grant will be helping to offset it. Um, but this past year's extended year programming um, costs are over budget. Um, in addition, crossing guards are trending over budget. It's another area that's sort of a constant struggle. So we try to find um, paraeducators or other part-time staff to do the crossing guard work. When we're unable to, we end up relying on the head custodians to go out and do the crossing guard work, and they're more expensive, um, typically, than what we have budgeted. So at a couple of the schools, we've had to have uh, head custodians do that work for most of the year. Um, and yes, and also, just we've had uh, elevated levels of overtime this year. We've had a number of, last year, we had a really large number of clerical retirements, and so we've had a lot of new positions that have had to have more training and just more time uh, to learn the position. In substitutes, uh, we're on track to finish over budget by $13,000. We had a long-term uh, leave absence that's pushed those costs up. Uh, special education, I think that's the same as Q2, it's tracking over budget. We had a new out-of-district placement that sort of went out after the budget was um, put in place, and that's pushing our out-of-district costs up and our transportation uh, costs over budget. Uh, expense accounts, are just second. Expense accounts are tracking as expected. Um, those are discretionary accounts that the principals have uh, control over and they spend it on supplies throughout the year. Um, and any unexpended funds in those accounts are typically used on PD at the end of the year for staff. And we have a lot of time at the end of this year because of no snow days, so we've got, I think, the most time we've had in a long time to do professional development, which is good. Utilities are on track to finish under budget um, due to savings and heating costs at Fort River and electricity costs at Wildwood. I was kind of scratching my head, like, why was Wildwood under budget with electricity? And then I remember it was vacant for two months this summer. Uh, <laughs> there was no activity in that building much. Um, That'll do it. That makes yeah. sense. All right, now I got it. Um, so that's, that was an unintended kind of benefit. 
Uh, transportation is expected to finish under budget. We went out to quote our all of our liability insurances that we um, have with the town of Amherst, and so for vehicles, we got we changed our providers. We went from um, and Charter, who's a, a local group here, um, with Hub International, who's a bigger group, like we have us at our rate. Um, so our transportation uh, vehicle insurance went down quite a bit, went down about $14,000. Mm -hmm. School lunch, we kind of received a nice presentation a few months ago, weeks ago. Um, that continues to be strong. Um, anything really above the 50% range is positive compared to prior um, experience. We've got you know, one district where it's trending a little bit under last year. It's Crocker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Crocker is under last year, so it might be just a uh, kind of a quirky thing with a specific group of students this year. But in general, this year, like the other schools is tracking better than last year. Risk and benefits are expected to finish with surplus due to the savings and health insurance, and also the same quote process we did for vehicle insurance, we did for liability insurance for our buildings, and that also provides provide some savings. So on the next page, let's see the chart. So this chart um, I updated with April numbers. So you can still see sort of the impact of the, the transition from being self-insured to fully insured. We're down about 11 plans from what we budgeted. Uh, and there was a big switch from PPO stage modes, which brought in savings as well. And in addition, the surcharge, which we thought would, could last up to two years, was suspended after six months. And then you can see the, the liability insurance went down about 12,000 for our buildings. So we've got a, some available funds, and we're looking to spend it on this bold list um, in the next paragraph. Uh, professional development, as I noted, at the school level, curriculum development, um, instructional materials and equipment. So we've reached out to principals in terms of like what are their needs. Um, another department has what are their needs right now. Um, the dual language curriculum materials that you just heard about, um, to facility equipment and supplies, and part of the budget for FY20 was that we would prepay retirement incentives from that budget this year. Um, we have the option of retirement incentives to pay them either in July or June, depending on what kind of budget year we have, and so this year, since it's a good budget year, we can pay them out of this fiscal year. And any remaining funds will revert back to the town's general fund at your end. Dr. Morris, do you want to say something? Yeah, just, just, I think the other thing, uh, particularly, um, actually all the items, particularly the first three, mm -hmm. is the last two budget years we've had to freeze the budget at certain times. Mm -hmm. So some of this also is letting principals, you know, letting them know what are the needs and what hasn't happened the last two years because we haven't been in a position to to be able to spend. And that and people have filled that out because we've had a typical budget year and people have spent their lives. Um, but I think it's worth noting just the context really matters in terms of things that just weren't purchased because of, you know, the opposite side of the health insurance bubble uh, the year, last year and we did have to freeze the budget for a time the year prior as well. Um, so I, I think, you know, they've done a really excellent job of prioritizing and talking to staff about what the needs are, what are things that just you know, have been sort of backlogged in terms of purchasing. So I um, just want to appreciate the process Sean runs to get impact from principals and how they get input, uh, excuse me, from staff as well. Yeah, it's focused on one-time costs. So we, you know, we say nothing that's going to create mm -hmm. a recurring thing in the future that we're going to have to worry about budgetary. Um, like new positions or anything. Well, yeah, like exactly. And um, and also just the last couple of years, I don't feel like we've had many days for professional development. It's a lot easier to do the professional development at the end of the year than it is mm -hmm. to get people to come back over the summer. Um, so that's sort of the best time is to tack it on right at the end of the year um, while they're still thinking about it. Yeah, I guess, um, so uh, obviously this is the end of the third quarter. You have some good visibility into where we're going to end up. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm not, I'm, I guess this, this is, logically this is a preamble to the next item, mm -hmm. which is a request to transfer items. Yes. I'm sort of going to ask a question that might have a bearing on that sure. here, which is, um, are, are you conservative at all in estimating what you think actually is available mm -hmm. to send? Because I'm assuming once you transfer it into another account, you've already worked out how to operationalize it. So un unlike the current budget, where you can cut kind of the end of the third quarter and say, oh, it turns out we didn't spend all of it. Right. The entire point of the transfers is it's likely that 100% of those funds will be expended. Mm -hmm. So is there, do you leave yourself a wiggle room? Yeah, so the, the uh, request we've got from the departments for needs, it, it doesn't fully expend um, what we're projecting to be available. There probably will, there likely will be funds available in the that will go back to the town. Um, and I don't think we're at any risk of going the other way, of thinking that we have a deficit. Think of anything, we're going to return some funds to the town at your end. Um, which sort of makes sense, again, because of the surplus of the health insurance. That's sort of a big 
budgetary uh, surprise this year. So, um, yeah, so I don't, I don't think we're at any risk of overspending. Dr. Morris? Yeah, and, and to Sean's point too, uh, while we certainly want to make sure our teachers and students and, and, and staff have what they need, you know, we do appreciate that they went up three and a half to three and a half percent yeah. last year to support mm -hmm. the budget given the health insurance piece. So, uh, most years, as Mr. Mangano knows, I'm like, bugging him incredibly at the end of June, being like, well, that's, you know, and, and this year we want to make sure the needs are met, and we got requests from the principals of different um, departments of the at central office, um, but we also do acknowledge that there was additional support offered to us as well. Any other questions from the committee for Mr. Montgomery or Dr. Morris? Ms. Spitzer? Um, just going over with the budget, is it yeah. too we Well, sure. I, I just wanted to highlight the ones where the town meeting added back in the tuition, but I believe that was for after school. Mm -hmm. So does this mean that going forward, we're also we're not going to have to have any cuts to the after school? Uh, yeah, we rolled over. I'll have okay. to double check, but I believe we rolled over the higher amount for next year in terms okay. of the tuition vouchers. Okay. Yeah. So I'll double check that. Okay, great. So I'll just quickly go through the, the transfers. Great, thank um, you. So some of them, they just have regular operating transfers, just the uh, principal or the department had requested a transfer from sort of a smaller one. Um, but the 10000 is adding back the funds that were approved at town meeting for tuition vouchers. We sort of held that in control accounts until we knew the budget was in good, good shape, and then we said we'd put it back if it was. So. Um, district point support. So um, one of the more volatile budgetary items at the elementary level is homeless transportation and foster transportation year to year and very mildly. Um, and this year, we've seen a, a large increase, particularly in the foster transportation. Um, and that, we don't get any reimbursement for. So we, a couple years ago, the end of year report, they changed um, how you report it. You have to separate foster and homeless now. You didn't use to ask. So now we, we report that. We don't get any reimbursement. Um, there is an um, effort by the state to try to get some federal reimbursement for foster transportation. It's not a survey. Um, or one of the districts they reached out to because we actually had a large uh, cost for it relative to our budget. Um, so we might get some money in the future to offset that, but it likely will go to town anyway, not directly to us. And just a quick note on yeah. that, it sounds like uh, part of the problem is related to the um, decline in the number of foster families, and therefore yeah, yeah. you have families that are actually spread out in a lot Farther. larger yeah. geographic area, yeah. and therefore we do, the, the transportation is impacted by right. it, yeah. yeah. Um, the accessibility audit that we just spoke about, so this is putting funds into the facility um, account to pay for that uh, accessibility audit. We were originally going to pay for that out of a revolving fund, but didn't have any other funds in the operating budget. Um, might as well keep the revolving fund the whole. Um, payroll, this is the increase related to the shift of the grant, a um, couple regular operating transfers. Um, control accounts, again, this is the sort of the, the offset. So where the difference between the increase and the decrease is the, the difference goes into control accounts. And that's the number that we can pay for some of those um, end of year requests from. We should just read those, though. I mean, I think it's worth the end of year request. Well, just that these uh, amounts. Oh, so for control accounts, yeah, so 217000 is what's being transferred into the control yeah. accounts. Um, and there, there's a large number actually there because there's some other accounts already down there um, that will be available for those end of year needs. Um, but more regular operating transfers, so risk and benefits, that's the big source of savings this year. So in total, um, transferring out 335000 related to the savings and health insurance and liability insurance. Um, transportation, we're transferring out as a savings, this uh, vehicle insurance savings. And utilities, same thing, the savings of heating, um, cost of a river, and electricity at Wildwood, that uh, savings is going to that control account. So Mr. Nakajima, balance. Okay. Can, I, can I go back to my question again? Mm -hmm. so I know you're, you're going to put my mind at ease, sure. but I just want to say that on the Q3 total expenses, you show us running 368000 in change mm -hmm. over budget. Under budget. Under budget. <coughs> Under budget. And then over here, we have 367 and change being moved into other accounts mm -hmm. for spending. Yeah. So do we have more wiggle room? Like I said earlier, that if expenses went a couple thousand one way or the other, yes. it would yes. still be covered? Yeah, because of that 360000 which that's being transferred, and 217000 of that is going to the it's not being transferred for a specific use, it's being transferred into the, the control account, which is where basically where we put identified savings. Um, and from that account is where we're going to approve the end of the year requests. And so again, we received the, those requests and we've compared that to what we anticipate have available. Um, and we're not approving exactly up to that amount, we're approving something less. Uh, and at the Amherst budget level, there's really not 
too many surprises at this point. The payroll is pretty much known. Um, you know, we don't have charter choice in our budget. Health insurance, health insurance is pretty stagnant at this point. So there's really, um, I don't anticipate any surprises. But, but, but also just mechanically, the point you're making is even though we're approving up very close to the amount mm -hmm. of uh, that we're under budget, in fact, you're, you're monitoring very closely as you're approving through. So over the next few weeks, when we get closer to the end of the actual fiscal year, you're, you're sort of making sure that you'd never spend right. or approve enough expenditures to, to bump up against that. Yeah, number. just so people have a sense of sort of our end of year process. So um, a couple of weeks ago, last week actually, so we sent out a uh, purchase order deadline. And it goes to all the department heads and principals and um, it gives them until May 15th to submit purchase orders. And after May 15th, we cut off new purchase orders. So on May 15th, we still have plenty of time to sort of close out the year. Um, we have an exact snapshot, basically, of what's out there. Um, and then there's all this work, basically, that we do to close out purchase orders that have been um, opened and created that they aren't going to spend. Because some people have open purchase orders for things they anticipate, and then they never end up spending it at all. Um, so then we work to close it out. So there actually could be some more funds that actually get freed out as we go through that process of closing out the open purchase orders. Mm -hmm. So just put another way, 150000 of this is actually accounted for right now in terms of what is, uh, is going to be spent. And then the remainder is basically just being held until at an actual, a later date. And it may or may not be used, but it sounds like probably not. Yeah, again, yeah, there's some wiggle room between yeah. how much we anticipate being available and what we've uh, worked with departments and principals to, to spend. Okay. Great. Uh, if there are no other questions for Mr. Mangano, um, there is a motion. If someone is feeling fair and ready. It's good, sir. Um, I move to approve budget transfers as shown above. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, Ms. McDonald, are there any further questions or comments for either Mr. Mangano or Dr. Morris? Okay, all those in favor of the uh, motion as stated? It is unanimous. Thank you very much. I do have to say that just a quick note, it's a remarkable, um, you know, we, as Dr. Morris mentioned previously, we were in a very different position last year to where we are this year. It feels a little weird. <laughs> um, it's great, but it's also, you know, it just uh, it gives you a sense of the volatility of these budgets, right, to a certain degree. And so having a process like this where we can check in, you know, on a regular basis just to make sure that we're doing okay and that we're really doing okay is, is really important. That's actually one of the reasons why, sorry, apologize. That's one of the reasons why I was asking. I mean, it may sound weird to the public to ask questions of, especially for someone who's been on like maybe a couple of years. It's like, so how do we deal with surpluses in the budget? It's like, we kind of haven't had this we problem. We haven't had this problem. So <laughs> we haven't had occasion to ask the question of how are you spending yeah. extra money appropriately. We usually have like smaller versions of this. It's always yeah. like a little bit. That yeah. Try and, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda is fundraising policy, which is also a possible vote. Dr. Morris? This is a policy that was passed by the region on March 26th uh, about school fundraising so that we have um, clear rules and approval processes um, to support, primarily to support staff, um, but also community members um, about the ways in which we have acceptable fundraising and the ways we want to you know, control for that. There's been a couple issues that, um, not in our district, but more, more generally have come up about, you know, where does cash go, who, who controls what, what's the accounting for it, and really it sets in place structures so that it supports um, the accounting we would want, not just for the sake of an audit, but actually just for good housekeeping of when funds are being raised, and particularly if they're um, connected to the school. So, um, you know, if anyone's committee or from the policy committee or some other wants to add to it, but um, I don't know how much more we want to and again, this is a policy that was reviewed by the Regional School Committee and approved um, in March. Mr. Mangano? Yeah, I'll just reiterate this. So this isn't for <coughs> student activities that has its own policies and procedures around it. This is really sort of staff, district level mm -hmm. fundraising initiatives. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the committee um, for either Mr. Mangano or Dr. Morris? Okay, there is a motion if uh, someone would like to, to make it. 
I move, to the, I move to approve the new fundraising policy as presented. Great. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Nakajima. Um, any other questions or comments? All those in favor? All right. Thank you very much. It was unanimous. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is a superintendent evaluation discussion. Uh, this is a conversation that has uh, already started at the regional level, um, and it's not a surprise for all the members on this committee because we had this conversation last year right around this time. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking back through our previous agendas, it looked like uh, we're basically on track more or less in the same exact timeline, which is happy news for me, um, but I also feel like we you know, can always do better just in terms of, of uh, getting along to this a lot faster. However, uh, I think for this cycle, um, what we did last year was that we you know, had a very general conversation around this topic here in this committee uh, at this meeting. And then the pre in the next meeting, we reviewed the, uh, the tool, the instrument that's actually used to evaluate the superintendent, um, had you know, input and feedback at that point from the, uh, the subcommittee that's been appointed by the regional um, uh, committee to deal with this process. Um, and then the following meeting after that is when we would be reviewing Dr. Morris' uh, artifacts and uh, you know, voting on the actual evaluation. Um, so I don't know if there's any you know, questions or comments from the committee at this point. This feels like it's fairly rote by now, which is funny to say, but it's true. Um, but this is the meeting to do that. <laughs> or if there's anything you would like to add, Dr. Morris. I think the artifact document will be ready before the next Amherst School Committee meeting um, because, you know, because of the way it's structured for the, all three committees. Um, well, the goals actually are more distinct than they have been in the past. The actual elements and standards are, are actually better aligned than the goals are. That actually, it may not make sense, but that's the way it worked out. Um, but it still we'll makes sense it. To, to work on it as one collaborative artifact document. So that'll be ready for the next Amherst School Committee. Great. That's a little. Okay. Do, we, do we have a sense of um, like what our schedule, like what our schedule is literally, like what what me what meeting are we, like which meetings are we planning on doing this stuff? Well, so you know, I think again, the, going by the the previous year's uh, timeline, our very next Amherst School Committee meeting would be when we'd be reviewing the instrument right. and the and the goals. Um, so that's in May. Okay. Uh, May. 21st. 21st, thank you. May 21st? Yeah. Wow. I know. So again, this is, you know, feeling some urgency if, you know, yeah, it's, no, it's great that we're sort of on track, but at the same time it feels like it's, it's always feels like it's late. Um, so May 21st uh, would be the review of the instrument. Does that sound right to everyone here? And, you know, just review the instrument or the article? The, well, the, the instrument, uh, and we would be given the artifact by Dr. Morris okay. presented the artifacts, yeah. Yeah, I think that's... That sounds about right, okay. Um, and then the following meeting would be June 11th, I believe, is that right? No, that's the art, that's the regional meeting, June 18th, mm -hmm. June 18th. Okay. So that would be our actual vote. That would be. On the superintendent's evaluation. So then the instrument would be put up um, by uh, Ms. Moreland between, after the 21st, exactly. and we, with time for us to all figure, fill out what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Does that work for everybody? Okay, great. Uh, and I will share that with Mr. Dumling um, as well. Okay, uh, if there's nothing else on this item, that really was just, just a quick review for everyone. Okay, we'll move us along. Uh, next item on the agenda is school committee meetings uh, format and location. So this has been a continuing topic of conversation for this committee. Um, I, I have to apologize. I actually uh, had hoped that we could meet at town hall tonight um, and it was just a, I think, a miscommunication. Um, but, you know, I haven't heard from the committee any concerns or very strong concerns anyway about doing it in town hall. Um, I'm taking that to be sort of a tacit approval of continuing to do that there. I've spoken with Dr. Well, Mr. Dumling and he's actually fine with us continuing to have these meetings at Town Hall. Um, so this is just a quick check-in. I think, you know, the, it sounds like, um, you know, Amherst Media is, is 
continuing to you know work with the school district to figure out the cameras in here um, but town hall still seems to be a better option technologically anyway mm -hmm. um, I haven't heard anything negative from the community I don't know if anyone here has about attending the meetings that's I, no, I'm not going to say anything negative I mean I was going to say oh, actually no. <laughs> no I mean I'm not I mean, I, actually what I what I was um, uh, I don't know if surprised the right word but I was just interested that the only f I'd gotten feedback from a few people and the feedback was all positive because a it's much easier to get the public transportation <coughs> and b it's reliably on the it's a lot reliably broadcast mm -hmm. and so if you want to stay home and put on PJs and watch the meetings then you can actually do that, do that right and then email us what you think afterwards <laughs> <laughs> and so like so you start thinking about it that way and you're like all right look if that's if that's an actually a better mode for people to be able to participate when they yeah. want, show up when they feel like it and watch it when they don't want to show up, then great. Yeah. And I've been proceeding cautiously with this committee with this topic because, you know, it is a big change, right? And, you know, I think a lot of people are used to, including myself, sometimes it's, a, you know, I have to stop and think, where am I going for this meeting? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I've also heard positive things, you know, and, and that's great. So, okay. Uh, Dr. Morris, did you want to? Yeah, I was just going to say, so we'll, for the two remaining meetings for this school year, uh, we'll contact Town Hall and just make sure the space is available and get back Great. to you about that. But I'll assume that it is, and, and um, unless you hear something differently from us, you know, it'll be on the agendas clearly, but uh, let's just assume that, that we'll make that transition for many Great, great. And then just very quickly, I think on the topic of uh, meetings format, um, you know, again, I think it sounds like the committee is on the same page just in terms of trying to keep these meetings you know uh, as efficient as possible um, mr. Demling and I met with dr. Morris to talk a little more you know thoroughly about this topic and to try to make some recommendations to the committee um, I think from our perspectives we didn't want to put any hard and fast rules on the committee I mean if there are topics that necessitate longer meetings and we're gonna have a longer meetings right and if there's you know uh, a lot of interest from the community uh, during public comments, you know, and there's issues that we really want to spend some time with, we will do that. But generally speaking, I think the idea is to try to keep these meetings to, you know, our sort of two hour agendas. If they carry after two and a half hours, that we will basically take this to a vote for the, the committee um, so that, you know, we can decide whether or not it merits continuing the conversation. And that requires, again, a lot of, you know, discipline on our part, right? Uh, working very closely with Dr. Morris and the staff you know, at the schools to make sure that we're all staying on, on topic and we're staying close to our agendas. Um, but I, it feels like the last couple of meetings have actually been pretty good, right? If, you know, the energy levels are a lot higher than they have been in the past, um, and hopefully that works for all the committee members. And uh, I think that's what we'll just continue doing from now on. Great, okay. Uh, so next item on the agenda is a regionalization update. Um, and Dr. Morris, is there anything you want to say on this, or? I will leave it to the elected okay. officials to That's kind of what I that. thought, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so, um, and you know, anyone who was at the last meeting on the 13th, uh, we had our two towns meeting between, uh, you know, Pelham and uh, Amherst. Um, it was a good meeting, I think, um, you know, very well attended, we had a quorum from all the different boards um, across both towns. Uh, people were very engaged and asking a lot of questions and um, you know this has been a, a, a topic of conversation not just at this in this area in this region among these two towns but also at a statewide level about the uh, you know the uh, attempts from many communities to try to regionalize in order to increase efficiencies you know across school districts and all of that I think the regionalization board has done a very good job of uh, staying true to their mission and continuing to move this forward and you know they have um, you know conducted themselves in that way uh, you know mr. Demling has chaired that that board um, but we also had members from both Amherst and Pelham who were serving on that board and they have put in a lot of hours in the past year and a half I guess uh, considering this question mm -hmm. uh, so it's translated into an incredible amount of work and thought um, you know and care uh, the outcome of that meeting on the 13th um, was that, uh, you know, Amherst uh, town officials and members of this committee actually recommended against regionalization for many different reasons, uh, primarily because of the uncertainty in relation to the new building project that we have just applied to the MSBA for state. 
um, you know, there's so much uncertainty there that uh, committing to regionalizing among the two towns uh, feels like uh, just a huge risk, right? And there's unknowns just in regards to who would actually, you know, uh, own the, the new building, right? Um, you know, whether or not that can negatively impact the application process and the whole feasibility study and all that. Uh, but I think beyond that as well, uh, just, you know, some serious concerns, which is the reality for a lot of our towns around finances more generally, you know, and, and long-term impact on our taxes um, and, you know, how we are uh, going into these kinds of decisions that will have, you know, binding financial decisions for, you know, for not just our schools, but our towns and our communities more, more broadly. So, um, uh, you know, from Mr. Dumling had actually prepared an update uh, to, you know, that, that I'm, it's just some bullet points for me to share with you here. I think I've, I've covered pretty much all of it. Uh, you know, what I will say is, um, you know, I think Pelham definitely expressed disappointment uh, during that meeting and they were, you know, they had been interested in moving forward with this. Um, our two towns have had a very, you know, uh, important, long-standing relationship. We share a superintendent. You know, we've had a good working, you know, neighbor, neighborly relationship for for many, many years. So we want to continue that. Um, and so this is, I think, a difficult conversation to have, right, at a community level. Um, you know, it's important to be respectful and to understand the positions, you know, both towns. Um, so there were forms that had been planned prior to the two towns meeting. Um, those forms were, were taking place one last night and one on Thursday this week, I believe, in Pelham. Uh, yeah, uh, Thursday the 25th. So residents from both towns have been invited to participate in those forums and to share their thinking on it. I don't believe the Amherst one was very well attended um, this earlier this week. I think it's just because of spring break and, you know, it's just a, an awkward time to ha have a forum like that. Um, we'll see what happens on Thursday night in the Pelham one, but you know, possibly um, more or less the same. Uh, so the board, the regionalization board, has yet to vote on this issue and to make the formal recommendation to either, you know, to, to do whatever it is that they're going to recommend. Um, we are expecting that they would come back to this committee at some future point once they've had a chance to vote, meet and vote, and you know, share their their formal recommendation. But that is basically just the status of, of everything right now. I don't know if there's uh, any other comments, Dr. Morris, Mr. Nagajim, or uh, any, um, Ms. Spitzer, if there's anything you'd like to add, having been at that meeting. I think I would just like to add that um, I hadn't had a real good read on what Pelham, the town of Pelham wanted. I think um, I um, have a lot of concerns about looking for a regionalization, but I think one of the things that was not, and I didn't feel like I received a lot of information was the desire of Pelham mm -hmm. before we had the breakout sessions. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just, I would just like to put out there that, and this is something I said, I think, around the table when we were um, meeting as a town, is that I think we should continue to be open to and in every way we can support Pelham because I, I do view them as neighbors and mm -hmm. folks that we really, you know, I never teach us in, in Pelham, you know, and, and, and I have good friends who live in Pelham, so I, I just, I want to make sure that um, we continue that relationship and do whatever we can um, to support the school system and mm -hmm. obviously the, the, the kids and staff there. You know, the only thing, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, it's the only thing I'd add to it is, um, I mean, one, I completely agree with what Mr. Ms. Fisher just said, that we, we should look for ways of continuing to partner. And I think if we're not, I, we, I mean, I'm echoing something I said actually the same day, one thing Mrs. Ms. Pister said, is that um, I think we should actually be, the next step after saying no, so to speak, should be, okay, great. Now, if we're not doing this, let's have really involved conversations about how we can find other ways of partnering that could provide some fiscal relief to Pelham, um, not at the disadvantage of Amherst. Well, you know, what are the ideas and what can we do, including around facilities and programming in schools? Mm -hmm. um, I know we're doing a lot of that already through Union 26, so it's tough. And then the other thing is, just to put a fine point on something, um, in a, in a, along with the concern around the statement of interest and 
a lot of unknowns around what would it mean to regionalize. I, I really respected the conversation that came out of all the different people who are from Amherst about we just went through a momentous uh, change in government and charter. It isn't in some ways even complete yet, right? Like we're still working through a lot of things. And the more we started to surface the complexity of all the different unknowns, some of which were fiscal, some of which were legal, some of which were like governance and representational, you just like you stop and you say to yourself, oh my God, we haven't even finished doing what we're doing right now as well as we need to. And the community hasn't had a time, chance to sort of digest all the changes, contribute to them, take our next steps together. This is not something we can do right now. And I, and I felt like if, you know, I'm saying this, I'm trying to say this now on, on camera and everything, because it, it supports everything you both said. But I also think it's something that if the public recognizes and says, look, when, when we said no at this point, and you think about what, what we're trying to do and accomplish collectively as, as current leaders in this town, um, it's, it's, it's actually a good thing. And it's even a good thing for Pelham in the end, because I'm not sure we were going to be able to say yes to anything that would be useful to them at this point. Yeah. And that's, you know, they need, they need things that actually help them, not for them to suddenly be stuck in the middle of, you know, between two towns, a really, really bad conversation. And I, and I think the sense was we were going to end up there, whether, whether we, full, we, we did realize it, but like if we hadn't realized it, guess what, six months from now, we were going to be like an absolute mess, and that mess was going to affect everything else we're doing, including the new school. Yeah. It feels like a lot of these uh, kinds of, of questions, timing is everything, right? And, you know, the timing on this, even though, again, you know, the board has taken a very long time to make sure that they are, you know, pursuing a process faithfully and authentically, um, it's still, you know, it, the, the timing for all the work that we have going on and the, the government change, as you, as you mentioned, Mr. Nakajima, uh, means that it's probably a bad time for, you know, for us to, to try to attempt this. Um, and I would just add to this too, I think, you know, Dr. Morris has sort of mentioned this a little bit and, um, you know, I know you and I have had this conversation uh, previously, but the, we had also been looking at this from an educational perspective and also thinking about are there certain efficiencies that could be gained uh, by, you know, bringing the school districts uh, together and, and, you know, combining our schools. And at the end of the day, they're not that great, right? And so it's, you know, it, um, you know, it's, it's probably not worth, it. in that risk analysis, you know, it's not worth taking that risk at this point in time to see if we can operationalize or gain, you know, some, some small efficiencies. Uh, we are also extremely uncertain about the state uh, in terms of helping to fund a lot of the regionalization efforts that are taking place. And again, you know, my, my points made at the very beginning of this discussion topic that this is an issue that has continuously come up in very many different communities, right, where the state has been encouraging communities to regionalize and has made a lot of promises in terms of the money that they could potentially get, uh, and then, you know, they're not actually realized, right? So, again, I think, you know, it was a, a useful conversation, a really useful exercise. Uh, at some point, if the communities, you know, are uh, interested in something like this, I heard from officials anyway, mm -hmm. you know, a openness to continuing the conversation uh, and coming back to it at some point in the future. Great. Okay. Um, thank you. So, uh, next item on the agenda is accept gifts. And I know we have one gift, it looks like. We do. Excellent. I will take a motion if somebody wants to read it. Mr. I move that the school committee approve the following gift. Project Bread, uh, number 68595, to support Teacher Champion Award School-Based Nutrition Program of Jennifer Reese's choosing at the amount of $1,000. Great. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, any questions about this? Comments? Mr. Dr. Morris? Very briefly. Um, so this is Project Bread has been our partner. Um, uh, uh, <coughs> Food program, I think has been talked about a couple times here, and a couple of you have attended events, and this was um, a request they made to Ms. Palmer, who was at our last meeting, around um, someone who's an educator who's making a huge difference in the nutrition of children. So Ms. Reese, if you were on the committee a couple years ago, you saw her come. She's our um, science and gardening coordinator. She's a part-time role. She does incredibly more than, uh, incredible amount in, in both in terms of the gardening, but also in terms of science education at the elementary level. She's only in the only works for the currently at the Amherst 
uh, elementary schools, you know, there was a slight FTE change to expand her uh, reach a little further. Um, so this was Ms. Palmer's uh, idea of an educator who's making a huge difference in, in the nutrition of children, so I just wanted to add that. That's great. Oh, Yay. Yeah. All those in favor? All right, well, thank you very much uh, to Project Red. Uh, school committee planning. Dr. Morris, you want to run through? Sure. So my understanding from the chair of this committee is that the Fort River Feasibility um, um, Committee will uh, have a presentation um, at the next, they'll be ready for a presentation at the May meeting um, with the architects. So I just want to, that's what I heard from Mr. Salvin. I want to you had anything different to share? I think May 21st they'll censor it. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard any difference since we last. Let's week. check in with him and make sure we will. So, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, considering how soon May is, I think I, we're yeah. going to be, we should be done. It's kind of, kind of, kind of close. Yeah. I did confirm this with him, but it's probably worth going yeah. back to that. It's, good. it's probably worth going back, yeah. Um, the, another one that has been kind of floating in our agendas, but we'd like to nail down and have at the next meeting is an, a presentation on Alice at the elementary level. Alice is mm -hmm. uh, the acronym that describes the current approach towards um, risk management and safety, school safety. Uh, and actually, the Amherst Police Department uh, representative would come in to talk about what they've done at the elementary, and particularly how that differs from what we've already heard for those of you who are here when it was a secondary approach. That obviously, the age of the kids makes it very different. Kids aren't involved in, in the training and planning, but the staff is. So. Uh, we wanted to come back and make sure they, that there was a presentation of this an interesting committee of that. Um, we have a uh, school improvement plan drafts from Parker Farm and Wildwood um, that has been worked on, but that's the date where they would mm -hmm. need some brief presentation last time. Um, a draft for ADA and capital, um, well, particularly to the ADA um, aspect mm -hmm. of the capital. Um, I think the grade six through eight, uh, the sixth grade piece that we talked about today, I've if the we could keep it in, of it, yep, I if think we could keep sense. it in the superintendent update, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm open to making an agenda topic, but I think I'll be able to do that. If that makes sense. Give it due time in, in that update, and that's what I have at the moment. Oh, and superintendent, superintendent evaluation. evaluation. Nothing important. Nothing important. <laughs> Great. Anything else from the committee for topics? I would just like to I'll be on vacation. I'll be on work trips. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be in Dallas, so unfortunately I'm not able to take time. You won't be here maybe. Um, and I know I've been the one of I think I'm the only person on this committee who's also on the evaluation subcommittee, so I think we should make sure we communicate as we end yeah. ahead of time. Absolutely. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, fantastic. I will take a motion. Mr. Nakajima. Move to adjourn. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? All right. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.